Welcome to LiveWire's Top Rated Fund Series. I'm your host, Ali Selby, and today I'm joined by T. Row Price's Sam Ruiz. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sam. Good to be here, Ali. To start off with, I'd love to know what actually motivates you as an individual. Yeah, I mean, thinking about what motivates me, I mean, we work in a super competitive industry. I'm pretty competitive myself, but I think that I'm very inquisitive. And when we think about the constant evolving puzzle that is markets, I think that the moment you feel like you've figured something out, markets have a really um, interesting way of humbling you and teaching a new lesson. So I'd have to say, you know, really thinking what motivates me professionally, it's that constant drive around where are markets going, you know, the, the real thing that we're striving for in markets is to have an insight into the future, but be faster than others in the market as well. So really trying to um, really compete with our peers and, and try to find that insight first, I think something that I find really exciting. Do you have an example of one of those humbling experiences? Oh, I think the humbling experience has to be back in COVID. So we think about March, it was really get rid of as much risk as possible. Mm. Uh, I think we did a, a decent job of pivoting risk back into the portfolio, but that was just such a different playbook you had to, to, had to look from. So I think a lot of people struggled with that, but um, I think the markets, you know, this whole disconnect between the economies and, and the recession we were expecting and what markets eventually did was pretty humbling. Can you take us through a little bit of your background and how it actually shaped your investment philosophy? Yeah, thinking over the, the last decade or so, a little bit longer, I think you know, we've seen an incredible amount of innovation, disruption, a lot of that has stemmed from tech. And when we think about our philosophy, it has a very strong focus, particularly on who the true special businesses are that continually compound and grow year after year. And I think that as we've seen that you know, really perforate industry all around the world. You know, there's not really an industry or region that is, um, has been sheltered from this. That's something that we continue to focus on day by day. And within our philosophy, you know, and how we run this global strategy, we really think the market continues to underestimate the value of these businesses compounding year after year after year. And that's why, you know, the very large majority of companies we're looking for are these types of special companies I keep referring to. And we think that if you have an approach that continually identifies these, maybe in pockets that haven't been found before, but that's a, a pretty good ingredient for strong returns. I, I'd say that you know, there are multiple humbling experiences you have in markets as well. So it's not just about focusing on the strongest growing quality companies, it's also trying to think about how do you blend in from a portfolio construction perspective, mm. diversity and balance in the portfolio. Something we put a lot of emphasis on, not just focusing on what we know, but also being humble about the things we don't know as well. What is one topic or investment theme that you and your team are spending the most time debating right now? It's very hard to get away from the topic of inflation. I think that's what everyone's talking about right now, but something that is probably the most challenging thing to debate right now is really COVID in general. So where are we in terms of the life cycle of this pandemic? And what's the pathway back to whatever the new normal is, not just normal, because there are going to be a lot of structural changes on the other side of COVID that I think it's really hard to predict, but you mm. have to be thinking forward about that. And, and why that theme in itself at the top level is something we're debating is because everything that are more the micro debates happening in markets really are stemming from that. So that has big impacts or ramifications for interest rates, for inflation, for the future of monetary policy, business behaviour, consumer behaviour, all mm. of this really stems from how the world responds and gets past COVID. How is that actually impacting your portfolios? Yeah, that's having a very big impact for everyone's portfolio. So the rotation's been extreme, but it's also, I'd almost describe it as bipolar within markets because you have one month value does incredibly well, then growth does really well, but yeah. these sort of oscillations are happening on a daily basis. So within our portfolio, given we are focused on these truly special, special you know, durably growing businesses, it's something that while we have introduced more cyclicality to benefit from the inevitable recovery trade or rotation that we've seen, we're actually finding now that while we had a really good opportunity during COVID to pick up cheap oversold cyclical businesses, that we're actually getting a similar opportunity now because the market just doesn't want to own anything that was a 2020 winner. Yeah. Where do you see us in the market cycle right now? 
In terms of the market cycle, we, we almost have a phrase or, or an acronym we use to describe this internally. So we call it the CRIC cycle. So you have the crisis, you have the response, you have the improvement, and then you have the complacency. Mm -hmm. So we think that we're more towards the end of complacency. Now, there's a lot of obvious, obvious warning signs. We've all heard about the retail behaviour, you know, new issuance in markets, SPACs. Cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrencies. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So this is all something, you know, central banks opened the floodgates of stimulus. A lot of this money is finding a home in markets and, and risk appetite has increased dramatically. What I would say, if we're in that complacency phase, if, if we are in this period of euphoria, is we're really focused in not trying to figure out which phase we're in, but it's almost trying to figure out the timeline or, or acknowledge that it's very hard to predict where you are because if we're in the later stages of dare I say it a bubble mm. there's a very big difference between being late cycle or early stage bubble and you think back to the tech bubble you know we had very smart people Alan Greenspan you know was talking about irrational exuberance back in 96 and there was a lot more to run in markets for the for the following four years so we think that we're somewhere in that sort of extreme sentiment phase but we're not, not really trying to rush into getting overly defensive right now. How many years left do you think we have of this stage then? That, that, that's impossible to predict. Um, Getting out your crystal ball. Someone can make a lot of money if you can, if you can figure that out. I think right now you don't want to try and determine how many years we have. I think you want to think about where their pockets of extreme are actually showing themselves. The first pocket of extreme was in, you know, a lot of this mid-cap software, a lot of these unprofitable businesses trading on um, revenues, not even profits. And you think about some of these businesses typically, and this is probably the best way to describe how extreme sentiment got. Mm. Pre-COVID, you might be trading at around 10 times EV to sales for a lot of these businesses, and they rocketed up above 30 times EV to sales. Now, that's something that is actually a really interesting point because some of these names have sold off 30, 40% in a matter of months in 2021, but we're still twice the multiple these businesses were trading. So optically, they look cheap relative to the peak crisis of COVID, but there could be more pain there. So we're trying to think about where the pockets of, of excess are, as opposed to trying to think about holistically when the market may run its course. We've talked a little bit about the risks that are currently in the market. Let's talk about what investors need to do now to get investment right over the coming decade. Yeah, I think what do investors need to do to, to get it right? Uh, it's a very big question. I think the first thing that I'd say is investors need to recalibrate their expectations. So we're at a point now where from the bottom, you know, we're talking markets up 70 or 80%. Mm. There's not, not many places you would have put your money that would have lost you money over the past 12 months because everything almost went up unanimously um, in, in synchronization. So I think that to get it right, and this really aligns to how we think about investing, is you want to think about which businesses truly will succeed over the next two to three years. And one test that, it's very simple, one test that we use is we think in the terms of if the market's closed today and you couldn't trade anything for the next three, five, seven years, what would you want to own now that would be worth the most on the other side of that? And I think that that is a really interesting test or question to ask yourself because the biggest debate right now is, obviously, what is this inflation cycle? Yeah. How hot is it? How long is it? And the market is really saying, where is the greatest acceleration going to be. Do I want a business like um, Zoom or where it be anything else that benefit DocuSign that may see large deceleration but decent growth or a business that maybe is going to accelerate 300% because they were decimated during COVID. So trying to time that is, is a big challenge. Markets are forward looking. They tend to predict these things quite well in terms of where the peak is. So for us, uh, my advice for investors would be think about the businesses that can continue to grow sustainably and will be worth more over that longer term horizon because picking this cycle, I think um, you might time it well on the way up, but if you don't get that apex or that, that peak, it, it could be tough. Asking that question to yourself, is there one stock that you would be happy to hold if the market closed for three years? Yeah, um, there's numerous. One, one, I think that actually, if we think about three years and you, and you do have that patience, um, we really like Zoom at the moment and it's quite a controversial name because it really is in that basket of companies that had extreme tailwinds from COVID mm. but have since been seen as this business that maybe people don't really want post-COVID. Do we all want to be stuck? We hear about Zoom fatigue. Um, even the CEO of Zoom fatigue on, oh, sorry, the CEO of Zoom on the earnings call highlighted even he had Zoom <laughs> fatigue. So. 
This is a business that saw a 300% revenue acceleration during COVID and the market doesn't want to own it now because it's going to decelerate to somewhere between 40 and 60%. Now, if you think about what that's meant for the stock, it's actually underperformed the broader global equity index by 60% since September. So this is a business that the market thinks doesn't have any second acts. Mm -hmm. We actually believe that they're going to turn that tailwind from COVID into new verticals that the market's not anticipating. So Zoom, we believe, will be a central communications platform for large enterprise, not just video conferencing. And if I can give you one example, they've actually recently launched internet phone. So this is where you can have on your desktop a phone, one flat fee per annum, unlimited calls anywhere in the world. It took their nearest competitor or their largest competitor two decades to actually get um, three million subscribers. They were actually able to get one million in 2020 alone. And that's gonna be upwards of 10% of the revenue base already growing further and accelerating, and the market's not even thinking about how Zoom can actually do this on a broader scale. Okay, and just finally, Sam, I'd love to know one piece of advice that you could give investors that would help them be more successful over the coming decade. My advice for investors, next decade, how can you be most successful, it is very simple. If you don't understand something, don't invest in it. <laughs> um, if you want to understand it, want to invest in it, um, find someone that does. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Yeah, good to be here.